The Centipole Wars Chapter 1 The howling sounds of sirens filled the streets of the city of Centipole as high above in the sky Amran raiders sped across firing somewhat indiscriminately at nearby targets and buildings. People were screaming in the streets. Mothers were cowering over their children. Chaos reigned. Yet, despite all the terror, very few people were actually injured, let alone killed. In one of the buildings of the city, there was a huge gaping hole on its side, like someone has taken a bite out of it. The President Centipole stood there on the open concrete floor, was about to speak on air to millions of viewers. The makeup was applied, the lights were set, and the auto cue was ready to roll. Hello, fellow Centipolians, the President began his message. Please do not panic during this time of terror, as we have been raided by our enemy. My military advisers have told me the enemy has been chased out of our skies and beyond our atmosphere. Three air raiders were taken down. Well done to the Sky Force. As you can tell, the recent raid by the evil Amrans has caused much chaos and terror. Our casualty list is still growing, but early reports indicate a number in the thousands of innocent men, women and children. As you can see, the damage was extensive. The president leered towards the concrete and debris of the damaged building. Yet we will rebuild. Lives will be saved and the injured will heal. We will fight back and the enemy will feel the full force of Centipol power and dominance. The image of the president speaking was viewed in front of a giant screen in the heart of Centipol City. Bystanders looked on as the President talked about the war and the revenge Centipole will have on the enemy planet Amran. A war that has been raging for hundreds of years. There were cheers and applause from the people surrounded the massive screen, 20 meters wide, positioned on the side of a building wall. Behind the side of the wall in a small alleyway, two crooks were getting their breath after a recent bit of thievery. Can you believe that guy? said Felix in a somewhat challenging manner to his companion Philip. Casualties in the thousands? My ass! I would hardly think one innocent man or woman would have been killed by the Amarans. When will the stupid war end? Don't worry Felix, said Philip in a reassurance manner. Remember this war is good for business. We will get a special pretty penny for our loot. Let's have a look shall we see? Philip was holding a small sack as he peered inside to look. It's gone, it's not there, said Philip dumbfounded. What are you talking about, knucklehead? Let me have a look, said Felix as he snatched the snack from the big man's grasp. I can't believe it, said Felix in dismay, and then his puzzled look became more astute. I can't believe it, he repeated but with conviction. Those sly, double-crossing, evil, sinister wenches have stolen our silver. Who? said Philip. Those mother... F oh, the sisters of the holy motherly heavenly saints, interrupted Philip. Ah, but how? They must have stolen it just as we were making the trade. Damn, I can't believe it. Philip stared at Felix in dismay. Felix took that in for a moment and responded. We have to get it back. We spent too much time and energy to steal that beige and silver, and goddammit, We've earned the right as good honest crooks to steal it back, which is rightfully ours. Well, rightfully ours stole in loot. Bajan silver is one of the most precious substances in the galaxy. It is very hard but surprisingly pliable, sparkles like diamonds, and glitters like gold. It is highly prized amongst many worlds, and some believe it to have spiritual benefits. But how? said Philip. The sisters have a well-guarded comfort. But they are revered across the sector. Your quick hand won't work this time like it did with the tarmax. No, you're right. But I have a plan, and I know someone who will give us the upper hand. The Centipole Wars 
CHAPTER II The two thieves were soon off on their hover bikes across the city of Centerpoel to a congested, somewhat poor district of the city. There were no signs of the recent raider attack. The attack only actually destroyed some communication towers, a few military hangars, some roads, and some larger high rise buildings one being the building the President gave his rousing speech. In actual fact only eight people were injured one seriously from the debris of the military hangar. Occasionally some people do die from the raids maybe three over a year. Their deaths are kept very secret their families compensated tremendously. The war between the planets of Amran and Prova from which Centipole is the dominant sovereignty has lasted many years but it has always been a war fought more on ideology and righteousness as well as money and prominence. The two races looking to exert influence on each other as well as nearby systems without wasting millions of lives. Both governments knew that if the real threat was imminent not that either had the resources or personnel to mount a real attack then the favors and social influences from revered religious groups, intergalactic unions, and interstellar peace bodies and the like will hurt them just as much. Not a puff of smoke affected the district of Centipole City known as Despot Lair. There was nothing for the Amrans to gain from firing here apart from grief and severe hatred from the locals. It included a mix of the poor, non-spiritual believers, over-righteous preachers and misfit intellects. Felix and Phil rode their two-man hoverbike through Despot Lair, waving on homeless and unfortunately some beggars too, which slowed down their progress to walking speed. They were interrupted by a man dressed in white robes and with a bold head. Peace to you, my sons, he said. Have you ever pondered about the spiritual center of our galaxy? The great white light is there for all to behold. Find your inner meaning, the makeup of your material stuff. I have seen it and witnessed the answers. Not today, brother, said Felix. We know of another great white light shimmering right here in Centipole. He whispered to with Phil with a smile. Beige and silver. The crowd of beggars were start to clear as they were about to speed off again, when they were interrupted again by a voluptuous lady dressed scantily, wearing immaculate jewelry. She came right up to Phil, who was sitting back at the deck of the hover bike and posed. Are you wishing you were about to experience an amazing sensation of pulses running through your body like Amran Raiders firing into your soul, my great handsome man? I cannot lie to you, darling, said Phil with a whimpering smile. You have a beautiful physique, but my love, you will have to wait until my Conrad and I can afford your soul-searching journey. This made Felix give out a chuckle. Je n'en fais, said Philip, which means goodbye in the eloquent Amran language. They continued on and wove their way through the area in a somewhat maze until at last they came to a building with a dome roof which had a sizable number of antennas and satellites sticking out from it. The, continue, the two companions got off their hover bike and Felix knocked on the door. In a near instant, a robotic arm came out from the front of the house and a red light beamed, scanning Felix from head to toe. What is your purpose? said the robot. I'm here to meet Yurik Poe, said Felix. What is your identity? My name is Felix Scundle. Meanwhile, Phil, a few meters away, was making a shuffling noise. The robot arm responded instantly and changed angle to scan Phil's figure. What is your identity? My name is Philip Dewsbury, said Phil proudly. Robot arm then quickly fixed a tractor pulse beam onto both Phil and Felix, locking their bodies. It repeated its first question, but with raised pitch and tempo. What is your purpose with Eric Poe? You may only speak. Felix tried to wiggle his arms and legs, but was unable to do so. He could feel movement only in his cheeks and jaw and realized he had enough free movement to talk and breathe, thank goodness. 
We are seeking out Europe Pope for a business proposition, said Felix soon after realizing his predicament. I am also known as Lightfingers, and my friend as Knucklebones. In an instant, the tractor beam grip on the two crooks were released, and the voice of the man came through the intercom next to the door. Light fingers and knuckle bones, the two and only. Sorry for the luck and beam, but I had to make sure you were who you were. I have your images already scanned to my computer, and it checks out. A business proposition, you say? We all know what that means. <laughs> then, my friends, please come in. The door quickly opened, and after a quick glance at each other, Phil and Felix walked on through. The Centipole Wars Chapter 3 The room they entered was dark and dingy. There was only a small window on the wall to the front, but covered with dark plastic blinds. The daylight cut through the slits of the blinds like shards of broken light, illuminated the room just enough to see what was in it. There was a table and a few chairs, carpeted flooring, a dark navy blue. Another small table stood at one end, on top a glass patterned vase with no flowers. This looks like a lovely hangout, said Phil sarcastically. Indeed, the room looked like it had hardly been used. The two thieves scanned the room for an exit and could just make out a door in the far corner. Felix took a step towards it but was then startled by the voice of Eurek again over another intercom or PA system coming from the ceiling. Please gentlemen, empty your weapons here. They will be quite safe. Zzz. Out from under the small table, a drawer pushed out. When I scanned your images, I could see you holding a plasma gun, knuckle bones, and a laser dart light fingers. So, if you please. Felix and Phil reluctantly withdrew their guns from under their garments and placed them in the drawer. Zzz. The drawer closed shut and then a click noise came from the door in the corner as it opened ajar slightly. The two companions proceeded through the door. In the next room there was a great deal more light so both Felix and Phil had to squint for a little bit. When their eyes adjusted they can make out a man sitting at a desk in front of several computer screens. He had an unshaven face, long greasy hair and tattered clothing. Hello Yurik, said Phil, recognising his old friend. It's been a while. I see you still don't trust anyone. Well why would you, said Phil, coming to Yurik's defence. We after all are in the middle of Despot Lair. Gentlemen, exclaimed Yurik, drawing attention to himself. I'm again sorry about the security, but you are right, Knucklebones, this is not the safest suburb in the galaxy. Too many unwelcoming souls like to wander the streets at night, tapping on this, knocking on that. I had a man stuck in the tractor beam for several hours because he was too passed out to talk. The robot arm can wait forever for an answer. Luckily I noticed him during the night when I woke up to get a drink. So what's this proposition you two have for me that you are so eagerly sought out my services for? Bajan Silver, said Felix secondly. Now we're talking, said Yurik with a grin. How can I help the two illustrious her knucklebones and light fingers? We'll get to that in a moment. You can stop calling us knucklebones and light figures. We haven't used those names in a while, plus we want to keep a low profile as to not attract any unwanted scouters. Sure, Lighty, I, I mean Felix. And Phil? said Yurik as he recalled the names they gave to the robotic arm. So where is this Bajan Silver? It's actually, we believe, in the confines of the sisters of the motherly saints right here in Centerbolt City. Phil began retelling Yurik how they were the ones who stole it from them just after they had stolen the silver from the tarmacs. You already had the Bajan silver in your possession? said Yurik with excitement. How on earth did the sisters steal it from you? 
This was not something either Felix or Phil was too happy to explain. It was rather embarrassing for them. They had just left the spaceport where they had stolen the silver from the Tarmax. An emissary group en route the planet to the planet Kalamana, stopping in Centipole to add their support to the government. The Amran raid delayed their journey, which gave Felix and Phil the perfect opportunity to break into their transporter ship and steal their Bajan silver. The ship was relatively unguarded, with most of the crew meeting with the president of Centipole to give an emergency briefing to the public. While Phil took care of the remaining guards using his knuckle boning technique, the locking, ne- locking mechanism proved little problems for Felix with his lightning quick ability to disarm the security codes. Uh, in this soon earned the reputation of this quick ability and the nickname Lightfingers became well known amongst the crime lords in many star systems while Philip acquired the alias of Knucklebones. Inside the ship were 10 bars of Bajan silver worth in excess of 5 million tarmac credits or 12 million galactic coupons depending on the exchange rate. Bajan silver is not as heavy as gold and the 10 bars proved no problem for a man like Philip to carry in his sack. On their way out of the spaceport they came across two nuns from the religious orders delivering a sermon in the city square, praying for peace during the Amran raid. There was a large gathering and the two nuns spotted Felix and Philip moving through the crowd rather quickly. Please brothers, stay and pray for peace and harmony, said one of the sisters in the center of the crowd. Another sister at the edge of the gathering ushered Felix and Phil to sit and pray. Pushing through a throng of strong believers was highly rude and could cause unwelcoming outrage and curiosity from the people. The thieves were obligated to sit down and pray. Following the lead from the nun in the center of the crowd, Felix and Philip raised their hands to the heavens, forming a V with their palms, before separating them. This was followed by chanting, Heavenly God, save us from evil. While the chanting went on, unbeknownst to Phil, one of the nuns had secretly exchanged his page on silver with several bronze candlesticks. The two thieves did not notice anything amiss, as the weight in the sack was quite similar. Not until they stopped off in the alley did they discover their loss. But how do the sisters know you are carrying beige and silver in your sack? asked Eurek, curious about their mishap. We don't know for sure, replied Felix. But it must have been them, as we didn't stop anywhere else. Felix paused for a moment. We must get that silver back, Yurik. It's worth millions. Okay, okay. So I think you need me to hack into a non-security system. But I don't think that would be enough. There are a lot of sisters and brothers wandering in and out of the convent. You'll need a, a large distraction. Exactly, said Phil with a half smile. You thought of something, queried Yurik, raising one eyebrow. But before either swindler could answer, Yurik added, I want 50%. Nice try, said Felix, but we'll be doing this dealing and putting ourselves at risk of being excommunicated, not just from the Order, but likely from this sector. We figure 20%. Guys, this is a sophisticated network. I'll need extra time to break the codes. 40%. As usual, Felix always held the upper hand with negotiations. You haven't heard our plan will work. 25% is our best offer. Plus, we could always go elsewhere. Phil and I know a couple of more hackers. Okay, fine, said Yurik begrudgingly. What then is your secret plan? Felix began to explain that in order for them to create a diversion, the best idea would be to create a phony blessing by the nuns. They would also need someone to seek their blessing in order for it to convince the nuns. However, they need not tell the individual that they are setting up a phony blessing. It would be more convincing if that person did not realize it in order to create the illusion. So Felix suggested to Yurik to scan the galactic web for any potential candidates seeking a special blessing from the Sisters of the Heavenly Motherly Saints. 
Uruk would also need to hack into the nun's computer itinerary system and create a phony appointment for the blessing once they have a viable candidate. So Uruk began scanning through the galactic web in nearby systems for a possible candidate. He looked through the nun's public domain for potential candidates. He came across several individuals, some too far away, some not important enough. He then came across a regal man seeking his way up the hierarchy from the planet of Amran. Running water, hard plain mountains, and beautiful white marble floors. Princess Anita bathed in a silky coconut and lavender oil infused cream bath. She looked immaculate with her hair done up in buns and twirls. It was mid-afternoon and she would expect her husband to be back soon from his Calixi hunt. Momentarily a man dressed in waterproof leather jackets and overalls holding a large hook with four large catfish-like creatures tread across the marble floors creating a squelching sound from his soaked boots and splashing water in his wake. Oh Pooh! exclaimed Anita. Will you please take those stinking fish out of here, Toshi? Prince Takoshi of the Lubinary province on the planet of Amran stood there on the entrance hall archway, casting a golden smile, proud of his achievement. This is my best bounty yet, said Takoshi. I can't wait to tell Lokatana of this. He will be pulling out hairs once he finds out I've beaten his record. Not that he has many left, mind you. Your record could go into the galley where it would be cut up, diced and sliced and fed to the dogs, said Anita, not impressed by the feat. Prince Dukoshi gargled a grunt before departing the chamber. Just before he left, something caught his mind. Oh, by the way, Anita, I posted an intention for a blessing with the holy motherly heavenly saints on the galactic web. I have put down 300,000 galactic coupons for the privilege. If I am successfully selected, our chances of becoming lords will be almost guaranteed. This certainly pleased Anita, as she stepped out of the bath, her naked body shimmering from the silky bath oils. Takoshi stared at her, almost transfixed by her beauty, as he stood there. Anita's handmaidens came and clothed her. She came right up to Takoshi, bearing a smile and pouting her lips. Now that is impressive, she said, and kissed Takoshi passionately on the lips, before her eyes lit up and her nose started to twitch. But can you please do something for me, Toshi? Take those foul stinking pieces of cat food out of the palace? Chapter 5 Sister Maria Helena was rushing around the convent of the Sisters of the Holy Motherly Heavenly Saints in Centipol City, looking like her life almost dependent on her completing her errands. Her heavenly clothed habits constricted her from running the running pace so she was restricted to a fast walk. The young novitiate, Sister Lucy, reached out and stopped her in her tracks. Whatever is so important, Sister Maria, that you must move around like you're fleeing from Amron Air Raiders? asked Sister Lucy. I am looking for, Sister Lucy, an ancient scroll that will help us get ever closer to our divine holiness, the God of Light. Is that a not enough reason to move at a rather quick pace? replied Sister Maria Helena, a little angered by Sister Lucy's curiosity. I'm sorry, Sister Maria, I didn't mean to intrude. I'm still learning the ways of the Order. How to behave, what questions to ask, and what not to ask, said Sister Lucy. She did not wear the complete attire of the Order's habit. She was not required to wear the full black veil, but rather a white coat or headband, indicating her inferior rank. That's quite all right, sister, said Sister Maria, feeling though she had shifted the blame to the younger nun. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have some research to do. And she rushed off along the halls of the convent before Sister Lucy could query her any further. 
The Centipole Wars Chapter 6 Yurik Po gulped down a shot at Zambua, a fiery spirit from the planet Jambu, made from fermented guava beans and red chilies, distilled for eight centuries. Its alcoholic content was matched by its capsaicin level, creating a deadly concoction. Indeed, deadly is an understatement. If you could handle the heat, you could drink yourself to death in a few minutes. A bottle of Zambua would set you back 5,000 galactic credits. Yurik may well, as may well live it up for now, for his stake in 12 bars of beige and silver would easily set him up for a lifetime of comfort and pleasure, allowing him the luxury to drink himself into oblivion if he so desires. He would not, however, go that far into an intoxicated state. He enjoyed his habitat in Despot Lair. He bothered no one, and no one bothered him. Otherwise, they would find the worst end of a day of an incapacitated movement thanks to his robotic arm. Yurik coughed and sneezed as his face went red from the drink. That is one hell of a drink, he stated. So we have ourselves a sucker for this fake ceremony, said Phil as he peered at the description of Prince Takashi on the monitor. An Umbran Prince as well. Why would he come here to set the pole? Doesn't he realize there is a war home? He must be desperate, said Felix. Indeed, said Yurik. They say a blessing from the motherly saints is well favored amongst the Amrans, no matter where it is being done. He probably is looking to move up in their hierarchy. But why not just seek a blessing from his home planet? asked Phil. Time and money, probably, said Yurik. I would also add he most likely has the available transport to something very fast to make the way to Prover in quick time. Who cares, said Felix, rather fed up with the background story. We have the ceremony set up for him. Now we have to start working on hacking into the convent safe. That's going to take a little bit of time, said Yurik. I'll need a couple of days to start be debugging their programming. Once I do that, I can secure a feed into the computer. But I'll need you two on the inside to manually access the mainframe. And how are we hell supposed to do that? asked Phil incredulously. Well, you guys will have to work out that for yourselves, replied Yurik. Not that he felt the question was necessarily directed at him. Don't worry, said Felix. Felix always felt he needed to be a step ahead of his companion most of the time. He kept their relationship as harmonious as possible. He kept Phil always a little arm's length with most of his plans. He kept, he kept him on edge, alive, able to rely on his instincts, which were always helpful for Felix to undercover any flaws in his plans. But if he distanced himself too much from his compatriot, then Phil had the means to either split from Felix, or decide to try and overpower him. However unlikely the latter could occur, Felix was not going to take that chance. Let us worry about that, Yurik, said Felix assuredly. But if it's going to take you two days to debug their system, what are we supposed to do in the meantime? I suggest you get acquainted with the nun's convent a little. It's across the city on the other side of Despot Lair. I suggest you don't meet back here for two days in case anyone gets suspicious. Hardly anyone comes to my quarters. I don't like to invite unwelcome curiosity. You can easily find a place to stay in Despot Lair. Try Ruby's Pension House. It's cheap, simple, and no one will ask any questions. Chapter 7 Felix and Phil exited Yurik's abode and returned to the hoverbike. Unfortunately, the bike had been vandalized. There was graffiti over the front fuel tank with the word X Illumini, written on it in black ink for the X and gold for the Illumini. Diabolical devils, what the hell have they done? exclaimed Felix. Felix, 
Field went to examine the bike further. He could see no further graffiti or damage. "Bastards!" added Field, and proceeded to wipe it off with a rag he fetched from the back compartment of the bike. The two nonchalantly hopped on their bike and sped off through the streets of Despot Lair. They decided to head for Ruby's pension house and book a room for two nights before they went to inspect the convent. Yuruk gave them further instructions on its whereabouts before they left, and in time found the house in a back street near the heart of the district. It looked basic enough and inconspicuous. There was parking at the rear for vehicles, hover bikes, hover cars, bus ships, and space copters. This was a place for interstellar travelers as well as interplanetary migrants, possibly from other cities of the Centipole Union or other smaller realms of Prova. There would be unlikely any trouble, but Felix and Phil knew to be careful and to be sure there were no undercover Centipole police who would be inquiring about the recent robbery of the Bajan Silver. Phil carefully commandeered his bike to a vacant spot and shut the engine. He then engaged the security mechanism with an encrypted code. It was nearly impossible to steal a hover bike without greater security. Also, any further tampering would see you zapped with taser spikes as further add-ons Phil put in. The two crooks proceeded upstairs into the building entrance and reception area. They were greeted by a lady with no hair and still studs in her eyebrows. Looking for a room, fellas, she said. What's the rate? asked Felix. Fifty collected coupons a night, she looked at the two men. They were quite the pair. So you want a double bed? she said facetiously with a cheeky grin. Felix moved to her and showed her two hundred credits as well as a glimpse of his laser darts. Two nights, separate beds, and no questions. The girl nodded and took the money. She went back behind the counter and handed him a digital key. Room 44, third floor on the right, she said, indicating towards the magno lift. The magno lift uses electromagnetic force to move the lift up and down, without friction. The two men entered the lift, and Felix immediately said, Level 3! and Lyft's computer responded to it, taking them up two levels in a few seconds. They exited the lift and turned right, before too long came to room 44. Inserted the digital key and entered the room. The room was modest but reasonably clean. It contained a holographic newsreader recounting the event of the day, including the Amaran raids earlier in the morning. Phil peered out of the window. It was just after first sundown but there was still plenty of light with the second sun, the smaller one, not due to set in an hour or so. We have a little over an hour before it's doubled down, said Phil. Shall we check out the convert? No, said Felix. There's too little light to see anything properly. Let's wait till tomorrow. Why don't we just visit one of the local taverns to hear if anyone said anything about our heist? Plus, I could do a one of those drinks Yurik had. A double shot of the Sambua. I left the room, leaving a bag Phil was carrying, containing their personal items and a change of clothes. They went to the lobby area and out through the front of the pension house, which faced the side street off from the main section of Despot Lair. They could see the main street from there, and there were many busy pedestrians and hover cars moving quickly. Without the comfort of their hover bike, they were more vulnerable, but both kept their weapons charged and concealed, ready to be used if necessary. Felix knew of a watering hole he used to venture in the early days of his criminal activities. When Felix was a young boy, he was exiled from his home, Erkenthal, which is on the opposite side of Prova in the Eastern Hemisphere. He was into petty crime, trespassing, and aggravated assault. The citizens of Erkenthal had no institution for juvenile crime, so banished him into exile. There was only one place to go, said Paul. He stowed away on a trading ship across the Sea of Suns, the only ocean in the planet. Prover is dominated 
by dry hot deserts and cold tundra. Landscapes, but in between there is land abundant in forests, fertile soils and grassland, from which the great civilization of Santa Paula arose. Felix came upon the city with some hope, trepidation, desire, awe, but mostly survival. He was hungry, thirsty and worn down. It was in desperate lair that he found refuge as many people there were also outcasts, either from mercantile or indeed other star systems. He did not he did what he only knew crime and stole from the wealthy passers by and naive aliens docking at the spaceport. As he grew more confident in his skill, he sought bigger bounty from trading ships from distant systems and diplomatic ships from nearby systems, favouring the cause for a dominant centre pole in the local group. For this, Felix needed information, and the local taverns were useful for that, when the crew and pilots used to come and after a few drinks became a little careless in revealing their mission and information about their ships and cargo. His favourite spot to visit was Star Barrels, as it was nearer to the spaceport on the east side of Despot Lair. They again proceeded through the busy streets, making their way through the usual beggars and religious fatics. Once again they were stopped by the same man dressed in white. I have seen the great white light, and it will reveal your innermost thoughts, he said. I think you're seeing something in your head, my friend, said Phil. It's the case of too many Zambuas. No, no, the great white light is at the great center. Join the silver with it, and you will start at the beginning, he said, looking directly at Felix. You're a crazy man, said Felix, and got his laser dart out and pointed it towards him. Now leave us alone. The man backed away. Felix put away his gun, and the duo moved on. Whatever the man meant, this was up to time to ponder or start a conversation. But Felix still felt uneasy about him looking directly at him. What did he mean? What was this great white light? What was the silver? Did he mean beige on silver? Does he know something about their theft? He tried to shake it out of his mind and focus on his current predicament of stealing back the beige on silver. To do that, they needed to get their heads around the security of the 